Doug Griffiths is a wildly popular community strategist and author of two best-selling editions of 13 Ways to Kill Your Community. He has supported, guided, and inspired hundreds of communities to create effective change. Whether through speaking and presentations or through advising and consulting, he is dedicated to helping communities across North America find their own pathway to success. He grew up on a ranch outside a small town where he learned the values of hard work, critical thinking, that background led him into politics, but he does insist that he has since been through rehab and recovered from that. His experience in politics gave him a deep understanding about how to move people and get things done. He deliberately retired from politics in January of 2015 after serving for 13 years to return to his passion of, of community building. Griffiths has an executive MBA and honors BA philosophy degree, as well as his Bachelor of Education, all from the University of Alberta where he has taught community and municipal leadership courses for elected officials and administration. Can everybody please welcome me and join me? Join in welcoming Mrs. Elkerton. Thank you. Okay, I have to fix that presentation because it's supposed to say wild and kind of popular, not wild and popular. I don't know where that came from. Um, so look, here's uh, we're going to go through a couple logistical things. Um, Gary was kind enough to give me some instructions that in case of emergency, proceed down the stairs. The the um, uh, gathering point is just out at the employee parking lot. If that exit is blocked, then go out the other door and washrooms are just over there, okay? Now also, I am going to first uh, go through um, sort of our philosophy behind how we do uh, strategic directions and the work that we do and how it all fits together, the seven essentials. Then I'm gonna take you through the work that we did as preliminary to creating the strategic direction. And we're gonna go through everything right up to the strategic direction and then we're gonna stop. And you're gonna go grab lunch and come back. Then we're gonna go through the strategic direction, okay? And then you can ask me any questions you want after that. Any questions in the meantime? Okay, so look, I have spent 30 years working on community building with municipalities all over North America. We have clients all over North America. Actually, we do most of our work in the United States now. And I was in politics. Like I said, I've been through rehab. I'm fully recovered. So I'm better now. But working with communities has taught me a lot about what communities need. So we have a particular approach. Now, I'm not criticizing other consultants, but lots of consultants, you hire them to do a strategic plan. They're very affordable. They're very cheap and what they do is they create a strategic plan they've done it once and then for every other strategic plan after that they take the name of the town off and put the new name of the town on new pictures new color palette and then turn that in and it's very generic and that in my experience never works because that's not a strategy I mean if you can rip the cover page off and block out the name of the town and read it and not know what community it's referring to then then that's not a strategy and yet so many communities do that in fact, they do one of two things. They either focus on being perfect, and I've seen it, that we did research 54% of communities across the western half of North America have the same slogan, the best place to work, live, and raise a family. Or they try and be like everybody else, which is the generic strategic plan that doesn't take them anywhere. And that's absolutely meaningless and worthless. Both of them are. I mean, imagine a community proclaiming it's perfect, the best place to work, live, and raise a family. Have you met a person that proclaims they're perfect? They're jerks. They're, you don't like being around them because they're know-it-alls and they think that they're the best at everything. No community on earth is the best at everything. None. And then when they try and be like everybody else with a genetic, generic strategic plan, it, it instantly becomes nothing and worthless. It's like trying to be exactly like everybody else. Have you met people that try and be like everybody else? They're boring. You don't want to be a jerk and you don't want to be boring. You just like every person need to be uniquely you. What are your strengths? What are your advantages? What can you leverage? You don't need to be like other communities. You need to just be you really well. So when we start with strategic plans and strategic directions, we have seven things that we do. The sixth one, which is kind of the last one, is marketing. Who are you talking to? Who are you trying to appeal? Who are you trying to attract? I mean, every community says they want 100 more people that move there and five new businesses. Well, I ask them, who do you, who, what does the first person look like? Who are you trying to attract? And they always shrug and go, I don't know. Well, how are you gonna get 100 people if you don't know what the first one looks like? 
They also say we need five new businesses. I always look at them and go, name me what business you want. They shrug and go, I don't know, we're open for business. Great, that's wonderful. If it's a market warehouse, are you happy with that? Most people say, yeah, okay. Say, oh, you want, what if it's four more marijuana shops that come to town and they want to open? Are you okay with that? But half the room's like, yeah, that's fine by me. What if it's a brothel? And then everyone looks and goes, no, 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 that's not what we're talking about. I'm like, oh, so you know what you don't want? Why don't you decide what you do want? Because I'll tell you what, when you say you're open for business, so is everybody else. That is not a marketing strategy. So you need to decide what businesses you want, what people you want. Well, if you're gonna, gonna go get them, you need to know what makes you unique. So we start with marketing at the end, the sixth one, and come around and assess the community, step number one, to find out what makes you stand out from everybody else. What makes you unique? What is your story that you can really sell? We go to number two with engagement, and we interviewed, what, over 37 or something, individual people, plus we had four focus groups meetings, and then we did a bunch of Zoom interviews too, sometimes with small groups. So we talked to a lot of people, sometimes, and you might not know this if you got interviewed, sometimes we're asking for your opinion, but most of the time we're planting seeds so that you start to think about your community a little differently. Because if you just ask for opinions, most people can only tell you what they know. Part of the engagement strategy is educating people about what Portage La Prairie and your region can be in the future. So we do the engagement, and then we do the strategic direction, and then sometimes communities say, could you help us with the budget? The budget is incredibly important, because if you're not putting money where your strategic priorities are, then is it really important? I mean, if I told you my number one priority was saving money for my kids' education, and then you asked me how much money I've saved and I said none, <laughs> would you believe it's really a priority? And yet I've seen communities do that. They say economic development's our number one priority. You look at their budget, no money spent on an economic development officer, no money spent on marketing, no money spent on anything to do with economic development. So somebody's lying to themselves. And we often do that in communities. It's like people. I mean, we, uh, I didn't bring the numbers with me so I'll be off by a bit. But there was a survey done of a thousand Americans, it wasn't Canadians, but I anticipate the results would be very similar. It did, asked about 100 questions to have Americans rank themselves according to the rest of what they thought the rest of the public was like. So when they did the survey, it was 87% of people, somewhere, I'm ballparking, 87% of people believed they were better parents than average parents. 78% believed they were better looking than the average person. 82% thought they were kinder than the average person. I mean, it was 74% it was or something thought they were better drivers than the average person. 73% thought they were better in bed than the average person. <laughs> Somebody's lying. We can't all be above average, but we do. We lie to ourselves as individuals and communities. So we've got to make sure the budget actually reflects the priorities. And then a brand, you guys have a great brand, it needs to be simple. But it's not the logo, which we always think a brand is. It's just the logo. It's not. The brand is who your community is. It's culture, what it stands for, what it values. And that is so incredibly important because it's your story coming true. It's not the logo. In Alberta, there are 31 communities that have a new brand. And those all the brand for all of them is a cow, a wheat field, a train, and an oil derrick. That's not a brand, that's a mural you put on the side of a building. And how can 31 communities have the same or almost the same brand? It really doesn't matter what the logo looks like, it's the story you're telling, that's your brand. My example is uh, Apple. I mean, there's lots of examples, but when you see the Apple logo with bite out of the apple, they don't even put the word Apple under it anymore. And if you look at it, you have instant feelings that it's about innovation, about creativity, about technology. It instantly tells a story. They don't have innovation, creativity, and, and technology built into the brand. It's part of the culture of belonging there. That's what you want for a brand for your community. You want that logo to preemptively tell the story about who you are. And then you need the marketing strategy, step number six, so you can go communicate to the people that you know are interested in what makes you unique, are interested in being engaged, are interested in your strategic priorities and understand why you're making those investments. That's how you do it. And then step number seven is always rinse and repeat. 
The biggest challenge we have with communities, and I, I, this is a perfect opportunity to tell you guys this because I haven't told this to council yet, is that every time you guys go vote and you elect a new council, the council decides we need to put our mark on this and they want a new strategy and a new direction. Could you imagine what would happen with great companies like Apple if every four years they had a new board of directors that picked an entirely new direction? You would have never heard of them. They have had a consistency about who they are and what they stand for all the way through. Yes, they nuance the operational plan so that they can make sure they have investments that align with their strategic priorities, but they have maintained a consistent brand and culture that has inspired people for a long time. And you know, it works. They haven't come out with anything new since the iPhone 3, but we still think that they do. Sorry, I'm a Google guy, so this is my little insult to Apple. But, and the same with your community. That's why I was so inspired when I got to spend a couple of days with council and administration. In all of my experience working with municipalities, this council and this administration showed the least amount of ego. The least, well, I want to put my mark on it. Well, this has got to be about me and my story. Every single one of them was focused on this community, this region, and its prosperity, not themselves. That bodes incredibly well for you all. So I'm gonna walk you through a couple of things. The engagement summary I said, we talked to, uh, yes, the engagement summary, we talked to, to over 35 people, and then we had a bunch of group sessions that we worked through. One thing that we learned um, that I thought was very interesting that stood out, and sorry, it won't appear, these are just my notes. When we were interviewing people and talking to people, had the focus groups, there were four perspectives that stood out. One, the community should remain the way it is. Number two, the community is plagued by crime and violence. Number three, the community should try to return to the good old days. And number four, nothing is going to change for the better for us. Now those were four depressing perspectives. But you know what I found interesting? Not one person we interviewed, okay, there was one person that we interviewed that felt one that way. But everyone else we interviewed didn't feel that way, didn't agree with a single one of these statements, but they thought everybody else thought these things, which was really strange to me. No one in this community, save for one person that we talked to, felt like the community had no hope, no future, things should return to the good old days, crime was a problem, and then nothing would get better. But so many people thought other people thought that. Now that's, that's actually a good thing, not a bad thing. Because there are three scenarios. Either everyone believes those things, and now you have a, an attitude problem and a culture problem, and you need investments to change it. Or everybody thinks everybody else thinks that way, which is transactional, it's, tra it's transitional. You're starting to realize, I don't believe that, but I still think other people do. And usually that's a legacy from when things were bad or, or did have challenges. Or um, you're actually starting to change the perception of the community and it's just in that transitional period. And that, that bodes really well. But that means that you'll see when we talk about marketing, there needs to be a change in the stories that you guys tell each other and you tell yourselves. That is gonna make a bigger impact than anything else that you do. This is our assessment of your community. If, if everyone in this room thinks the community's fantastic, you're headed in the right direction, things are improving, but you keep telling other people, yeah, but everybody else thinks that it's a dump and it's a horrible place, what's the story? That it's a dump and a horrible place. And either that starts to turn back to the negative and becomes true, or you change the conversations and stop saying how things are wrong or how other people think things are wrong, and you go back to focusing on, yeah, a few people might feel that way, but look at the amazing things that are happening. Crime is down, Main Street's being reinvented, new buildings are going up, new businesses are locating here. We have new partnerships and legacy partnerships that have been incredibly successful and actually the rest of the world envies. You see how the story changes? Whatever you think, whatever you have as individuals for conversations becomes true. I was a junior high teacher and I can tell you right now that I watched brilliant kids come in and they have been told by their parents, you're an idiot, you can't do this, our family never succeeds, you're gonna fail, and they managed to fail, even though they were brilliant. But I watched kids that were less talented come in and say, my mom and dad think I can do anything, and somehow they managed to do incredible things. Because if you believe 
it, it will come true. And if your conversation, whatever that is, reflects negativity or positivity, that's the direction you're headed to. So you, all in this room, have to start to change the story. Not because people out there believe things are negative, but because they believe other people think things are negative. That was one of the most uh, interesting observations because I've never seen a community feel that strongly as yours did. And so we had recommendations around collaboration, which we'll go through later, around economic opportunity, around uh, uh, well, the stuff that's in between there, the quality of life, uh, and then we get to your story. Sorry, I'm just I don't want to go past it, and it'll go back and forth. There it is. Now I'm going to read this to you. The way we do strategic directions, this whole report is quite long, but the way we do strategic directions is that first we write a story for, well, you don't, that's not first. But you'll see first is a story. In that story, it's only half a page and there are only three paragraphs. The first one is who you were as a community. The second paragraph is who you are as a community. And the third one is who you are becoming. Again, remember, the end goal is to be able to market, to attract new people and new businesses to help your community grow. If you can't summarize who you were, who you are, and where you're going in a powerful story, because indigenous communities have taught us how much story moves people. It's not the facts, it's the emotional story that you tell. If you can't sum up where you're going in a three-story elevator ride, then you can't communicate it at all. Too many marketing and communication strategies are 10 pages long, and no one's going to read that, and no one's going to listen to that. You have to be concise. And then... We have the vision and the mission for your community. Then we have what you value most. Most is important here. Um, a lot of consultants will list you know, what we value. What we value always comes down to uh, uh, integrity, accountability, and transparency. And I always laugh. I have no idea what the hell those have to do with the strategy, but they make people feel good. Transparency is in almost every municipal strategic plan. You won't find it in one of ours. Because the Municipal Government Act says what you have to be transparent about, period. And tells you what you can't be transparent about. A, a new company shows up here and gives, gives council or administration proprietary information about what they're gonna do, where they need to invest. They can't share that with you. It's not their information to share. So suddenly they're not transparent. The MJ covers it all. Why do you have to put transparency in there except to, to tell you, now feel good about yourself. The next one is always accountability, and I laugh about that. I have no idea why a council has to put accountability in a, in a strategic plan. They get elected or unelected every four years, whether they like it or not. Why do you have to put down accountability? You have to be accountable, period. And the third one, integrity. I always laugh at that because my grandpa always used to say to me, anyone who tells you they're not a liar is a liar. Not because we're all liars. That's not what he meant. He just meant that we project on others what we know about ourselves. I, I could know you my entire life. We could be best friends, but I still don't know what you really feel inside, just what you show me. The only person I really know deep down inside is me. So if I'm an honest person, I assume everyone else is like me and we're all honest, which is probably why I get taken advantage of sometimes. I'd still rather be honest. Honest people get taken advantage of because they think everyone else is also honest. Liars think everyone else in the room is also a liar. So they try and pull the wool over everyone's eyes by making them think, I'm not a liar. And what do they say? I'm not a liar. That's the first thing they do. So I always tell everybody, the second you say you've got integrity, do you? You don't have to say it, just do it. So we make you pick what you value most. And we're gonna lay those out after we come back but the thing I want you to go away with right now is the story. It takes the longest time to write because I always think the brevity of words is the hardest work to do. I could obviously write a story that's 80 pages long. It takes a long time to get it down to three paragraphs to sum up who you are. So I want to read that to you and then, or then is it lunch? I have to call work because it's arriving. What's that? It should okay. be arriving right away. All right. Here we go. Your story. The uniquely moderate climate between Assiniboia River and Lake Manitoba made our location a natural congregation point and home for indigenous nations such as the Anishinaabe, 
Ojibwa, Cree, and Dakota Sioux dating back over 10,000 years. We continue to be an island on the prairies as the fur trade grew, attracting investment in forts by both the Northwest and Hudson's Bay Company. In 1868, a councillor with Louis Riel's provisional government even tried to establish our region as an independent state and a new republic called Manitoba. Our creation of, our creation of determined leaders continues to this day producing five of our province's 24 premiers. Paragraph two. The city of Portage La Prairie remains an island on the prairies with incredible transportation assets complementing our unique natural resources and industries, supported by our ample natural and built amenities that ensure our citizens enjoy a wonderful quality of life. Both national railway lines, the Trans-Canada Highway, and a world-class airport and Southport Aerospace Center encourages food production industries and horticulture research facilities already excited to take advantage of our ample water, quality soil, and nation-leading sunny days to locate in the Portage region. Our unique climate and resources truly make us the island breadbasket of the nation. Third paragraph. We will continue to show leadership as we expand on our reputation as a region that works together to address challenges and take advantage of arising opportunities. Our partnerships have allowed us to invest in and build a quality of life that attracts families, professionals, and a labor pool that adds fuel to the fire, attracting even more new investments and businesses. <clears throat> the Island Park is iconic of how leadership in our region has come together to build a quality of life that sets the city of Portage La Prairie apart from others. We will continue leading the way in cooperation and collaboration with our neighbor communities, national and international newcomers, growing businesses and industries, and Indigenous Nations partners to remain strong and take advantage of what makes us unique and has always made us unique, an island of the prairies. I like it. <laughs> So you see what I mean? It didn't, it didn't, it's not a story about who did what and, and things arriving. I mean, I was just in Halifax finishing a, a strategic plan in Nova Scotia, and I pointed out to them, and I'll use the same example to you, you've all heard of the Halifax Harbor explosion, right? It, I mean, we all know hundreds of people died. They were hauled into shore. They were put in schools and in churches, the dead bodies, the, the ones that survived. It was a disaster. Tell me the year, tell me how many people died. You can't. Most people couldn't even tell me that in Nova Scotia, right where it happened. Because the details, we can always look up. The facts aren't quite as interesting as the emotional appeal. The story doesn't matter exactly what year things were done. It doesn't matter exactly what contracts were signed. It's the story about who you were, who you are, and who you're becoming. And you are the island breadbasket on the prairies. You are the island of the prairies, and for so many reasons, for agricultural reasons, for cultural reasons, for historic reasons, it's an amazing story that you have to be able to tell in that short three-story elevator ride to capture attention. You have all the assets you need. The facts will take care of themselves. What you needed was that story. So are we trying to time this with one? Because I don't want it to get cold. That? You can keep going. Oh, well, I didn't have anything else to keep going with. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Uh, so, uh, I'm just going to switch this over so I can. Uh, sorry, glasses, no glasses. I hate getting older. Actually, <laughs> take that back. I like getting older. The alternative is really bad. <laughs> Yeah, just, just two minutes to set up. Oh, two minutes. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you. All right, so we broke your story out, the one I just wrote, uh, just read to you, in the, in the six different areas, historic significance, leadership legacy, unique advantages, quality of life, a collaborative approach, and your future direction. In my mind, every story has six elements, and they're always different. But these are the six elements we broke in for you. Now, these are what, when I said, instead of integrity, transparency, and accountability, what you value most, 
This is where you're going to put your time and energy. This is where you're going to put your money. This is where the rubber hits the road, where your investments are going to be made. Because every municipality and every community has limited time, limited money, limited resources to invest. This helps prevent a tyranny of the urgent. This helps prevent any arising issue from just, it's, oh, we got a little crisis, I want this done, being pulled in different directions. So, we have said what you value most, where you're going to focus your priorities on, are inclusive relationships. So diversity is what fuels your economic success and partnerships with indigenous communities, with neighboring municipalities, with industry, with business, also with your provincial government even, um, because, I mean, you have some challenges. You've got great water resources, um, but you're always at risk with the industry relying on those water resources. And Because if a couple of them collapse, you might have a lot of overhead cap, uh, capital costs you continue to have to pay for. So you need to work on those partnerships endlessly. Number two, the economic opportunity. You already have a fantastic, um, and thanks for that Eve, I use it as an example all the time, a concierge service approach to your businesses. You guys have actually quite an extensive brand and reputation that when someone shows up here to do business, the permitting process, the business processes are very streamlined, very smooth, and actually quite fast compared to other jurisdictions. Which, uh, I gotta tell you, I already said this before, everyone says we're open for business, and they think that they are, but they are not. And in fact, a lot of business processes that people go through, um, it's like a house cleaning, right? Uh, you move into a new house or your first house and you bring all of your stuff with you and you put everything where it's supposed to go on the shelf and if you've ever noticed eight or ten years goes by and you start to look and say what is this thing who bought this and why do we have it so you got to do a spring cleaning business processes are the same you can have them very clean and streamlined and then you accumulate small idiosyncrasies in the protest process that start to bind you back and stop you from moving forward you guys have an exceptional process our recommendation is that you don't sit on your laurels, you constantly refresh that to make sure that they remain uh, streamlined and exceptional processes. Marketing and communications, I am a big believer in, in that being your, your last step and ultimately your success. For marketing and communications though, I want you to think, everyone thinks marketing strategies involve communicating outward to business and the external world about what you're doing, yes but that's only half of it. How many people are in Portage? Population? The city or the entire region? The entire region. So you have about uh, roughly 14,000 in the city and the RM county is All right, let's round it to 20,000 people, okay? Good round number of people in the Portage area. If everyone in this, what we, sorry, we hired a statistician at the University of Alberta to help us with this to find out what the direct marketing uh, results would be, and it was a factor of 20. So if you have 20,000 people, you multiply that by 20, that's 400,000 people you directly market to by word of mouth. So if every one of the 20,000 people in this region is saying, yeah, you don't want to come here because there's too much crime, investment is too risky, nobody cares about us, we don't have partnerships with the right levels of government, uh, you don't want to come here, then you've got 400,000 people you do, who have directly heard that, and good luck trying to attract investment or development. Because your story with those 400,000 people, which is almost half the population of this larger region in the province, it, that's impactful, negatively. But if you're 20,000 people, at a factor of 20, are reaching to 400,000 people saying, we have great partnerships, we have new innovation and, and business relationships with indigenous partners and communities. We've got the province backing up our water investment so we can attract new, more wet industries. Our quality of life is good. Main Street's being beautified. New businesses are coming. Our storefronts are improving. Our housing issues are being addressed. That is all powerful, positive marketing to over 400,000 people. So I always tell people internal marketing is important that your story in this community has to be dominated by those positive messages. Because if you, the province of Manitoba gave you guys $10 million to market this community in this region, and everyone was being negative, you might as well take the $10 million and go to Tim Hortons, because it won't be a drop in the bucket or change the story you're creating yourself. So I emphasize communications and marketing, internal is half of the battle, which is why I keep telling you guys that.
Number four, the downtown core. You have great improvements going on with the downtown core with your sidewalk and your main street. It's great. We also advise uh, that's a start. And I know it's, you guys have one of the biggest challenges you have in Portage of Prairie proper is that you've got a main street that is one of the longest in Canada. It's 1.5 kilometers long. Everyone else is dealing with three or four blocks to get started. So we had suggested um, as one of the strategies when you're working on Main Street, you need storefront improvements, but if one storefront of one block improved and two blocks further down, another one improved and then another one two blocks away, it, you'll lose it because it won't be consistent. So we suggest that as you move forward on your Main Street improvements, start where the City Hall is and work your way out block by block um, on both sides of the street to, to improve that so that you can see results. Because I'll tell you, you guys will see one building improved and then another one three blocks away improved. It doesn't change the story in your mind about how Main Street looks. You need visuals to change the perception, to change the reality. And last one, quality of life. You have made some incredible investments on the island with your recreation <laughs> facilities. I mean, you guys have two, an indoor and an outdoor pool, indoor slides, outdoor slides. You've got two golf courses, one that's really easy, nine hole. Well, I'm assuming if you're good golfers, for me, it's still pretty hard. And a challenging 18 hole golf course. You have so many amazing facilities to leverage for a quality of life. Like I would challenge anyone who lives in Winnipeg or Edmonton or Toronto for that matter to say they have better access to equitable facilities that you have. I mean, they may have them, but they're expensive, they cost a lot, they're too full, they can't, and they're not close enough. You guys just have everything going for you to sell the quality of life that you have. Doesn't mean you don't keep working on it. You could use some more diverse restaurants. I mean, I highlighted in the report that I've never seen a place that has more pizza joints in my life. And I like pizza, but per capita, you, you're, you're full. You're, you're full of pizza. With that, and chicken places too. Like, I, lots of chicken places. And so I always emphasize, like you've got so many great facilities going for you, so much opportunity, but quality of life is more than just the public provided, government provided facilities. The swimming pool and the walking track and the workout facilities, and it is also, and I want you to think about this, if you, every municipality in Canada works to attract their own doctors. When you're trying to talk to a doctor to attract them here, what do you sell them? Not just the government owned facilities. You sell them on the diversity of the restaurants. The incredible access, believe it or not, to go watch the Winnipeg Jets play. Like it's not that far away compared to, I, I lived in Edmonton. It would take me longer to drive seven kilometers to get down st to the legislature. It'd take me 45 minutes of honking and people yelling and screaming at me and weaving in and out of traffic. When I lived out in the country, it took me half an hour to drive to school and it was 35 kilometers and it was a much nicer drive. Like you've got so much to even sell in Winnipeg, um, from Winnipeg. And I, that's before we take the lunch break now, one last point I just want to emphasize to you. A lot of people think, and we heard it in the conversations, that being this close to Winnipeg is a hindrance. It holds you back. No, you are at the perfect spot. Every time I drive out here, it seems to go faster and it's a nice drive. You're not close enough to be a bedroom community, but you're close enough that people can come here to live. It is a huge asset for you guys. It's a little like I have said over and over again to Moose Jaw being close to, to uh, Regina. The best thing about Moose Jaw is that it's not Regina. And the best thing for you guys is that you can point out you're not Winnipeg. But you have so much to offer and any extra stuff you need is close proximity. Winnipeg is not killing your community and it's not hurting it at all. It is, an, it is an asset you can leverage to draw more people here. So these are the five areas of focus. After lunch, I'm gonna delve into them a bit more and then I'm gonna show you what your council has chosen for the areas they're gonna to start to focus on and work on uh, and then we'll take any questions you have, okay? So we went through these five, uh, what you value most. Now I wanna take you through what council has talked about out of the, our, our uh, recommendations and our advice for objectives and strategies is pretty comprehensive. No one can do everything all at once because you have limited time resources. 
So council's gone through and prioritized where they want to start focusing on initiatives based on those five categories. So, quality of life. They want to build on past investments for culture and recreational activities, providing housing growth opportunities. The objectives that they want to follow through on, council will collaborate with developers for sustainable community growth. Now, that means finding not just any developers, but finding the right developers who are going to build the things that this community needs, it fits its needs, fits its house, housing requirements. And you had developer days already in the summer, which attracted developers from all over to come around to Portage the Prairie to identify how amazing this community is. And the stories I heard were that a lot of developers showed up to get a, a bit of a free lunch and see how things were going. And by the end of the day, they said, wow, there is a lot going on here. It's a great place to invest. So again, instead of waiting, saying we're open for business, go and get them and bring them here to showcase what your community is doing. Number two, they said improve recreational, cultural opportunities, green spaces, and expand active transportation. Some of that work you can see reflected in the Main Street improvements with the sidewalk. There's going to be more, more uh, uh, green spaces, more social gathering spaces. You guys already have a pretty robust active transportation network, but they're going to continue to work on that because it is a walkable community. And in all of the things, all the research that we did about what communities are looking for, number one was walkable community. Number two was healthcare. It, I found it really funny that people wanted to be able to walk around the community and if they got hurt walking on the trail, it was okay if there was no doctor as long as they could keep walking. It's kind of a little ironic and funny, but walkability, healthcare, and then specifically walking trails was third. Um, and promote positive infill developments to increase density and reinvestments in established neighborhoods. I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, uh, density helps with affordability. And that is a, a challenge with housing right now, all around North America, is that housing's expensive. And most communities want to attract a developer and build a, a three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage <laughs> subdivision. All the houses look the same. And I always ask communities, who's moving into them? Those three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garages. And they say, well, families are. No, oh, where are the families coming from when they don't have a house if they're coming from somewhere else? It was like me, I push them until they name a community. And I say, oh, oh, they're coming from another community. What is it like in that community where they are? Saying, well, they have a house, their kids go to school, they have jobs. I'm like, so why are they moving just because you have a house? You actually need densification and alternative housing to attract young professionals, young people, semi-retirees, people who aren't just looking for the three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage type units. And densification helps with transportation, because now you can have transportation nodes when you have densification to allow uh, people to gather better, to, to ride transit, and you bring in more affordability. Plus, you increase, as a municipality, <coughs> the tax base on a smaller parcel of land. What is the largest city by land mass in North America, covering land? <coughs> nope. Nope. Los Angeles. Do you know what the number two largest city by land mass is? Calgary. Calgary keeps spreading out. And all research indicates now that every time Calgary stretches another mile, their cost of delivering services doubles. So this, this spread out cost municipalities it becomes, becomes uneconomical. And municipalities will tell you they don't make money from residential. They barely break even after years. It costs money. So the more you spread out, the less viable the municipality is in offering the services you want. So densification is important for addressing services, addressing portability, and transportation. That is what council will do under the first tier. Number two, community safety and well-being. Council's dedicated to fostering community-wide collaboration to ensure the safety, well-being, and sense of security for all residents working alongside our partners to achieve this shared goal. They picked three priority areas for focus in that. Recruit and train community safety officers to aid RCMP in enhancing community safety. I know that defund the police is a very popular phrase these days. We still need police desperately. We need to give police more community partners to help address those social issues that are challenging every community. Yours is not alone. 
Number two, implement recommendations for the community driven safety and well being <laughs> plan. So there is a plan in place and they're going to implement those recommendations. And number three, sustain support for community mobilization, offering positive assistance and early intervention for at risk individuals. Uh, this to me, I was so excited when council chose this and identified this as a priority because normally we fix some of the problems, we put people in jail, we release them from jail, they go back and they have no home, they have nowhere to go, they have no resources. So we're, our entire society is based on, on bandaging up the wound. It's based on trying to treat it after the infection's been developed instead of trying to help people before they become homeless, before they become addicted, before they have to turn to crime. And so this is an ambitious initiative for any municipality to undertake, but I think you guys can do it. And I'm pretty excited by council's desire to try and prevent the situation from occurring instead of fixing it after. The third pillar, economic opportunity. Leveraging accessible transportation, diverse infrastructure, quality services, innovative industries, and exceptional amenities to foster economic and population growth within the region. Economic and population growth. Most communities don't actually undertake that. Council will sustain utility infrastructure investment to expand and retain industrial developments. And I mentioned, I alluded this to this a bit before, you guys have a lot of wet industries drawn to this area. The province supports wet industries coming to this area. You've invested in the infrastructure you need to provide those wet industries with the water resources they need. The capital cost of that is high, and the operating costs are based on volume. And so if some of those industries left, you could find yourself, find yourself in a bit of a quandary. I don't anticipate that coming. But as you continue to attract new wet industries who rely on those wet resources and your incredibly unique climate here, you're gonna to need to make sure that your infrastructure, your building is sustainable over the long term. That's an incredibly important initiative. Oops. Collaborate with the business community to attract new commercial ventures in downtown areas and former Portage Mall properties. Very important, I, I think that almost speaks for itself. Go get the businesses you want. And as I suggested, if I was to start at City Hall and work my way out, I would try and add social elements there. A theater, a wine bar, a brew pub, a boutique hotel, and continue to advance that out because you want shoppable, walkable Main Street communities. But instead of saying we're open for business, their plan is to go get the businesses that they need that will enhance Main Street and make it better. Um, and a place that people want to come down and hang around at. And number three, support organizations aiming to enhance transit options for the region. Again, transportation is a growing industry. It, it's kind of funny, my, uh, my niece and nephew have no plan on ever owning a vehicle. And so they will always live somewhere where there's public transportation or Uber or some other form they can take. I remember my nephew's pretty smart. He said, uh, um, Uncle Doug, why would I buy a $40,000 vehicle that depreciates by $10,000 the moment I drive it off the lot and then is wor worthless in six years? Why, think about how many Uber rides I could go on, how much public transportation I could go on and put that money into investments or paying down a house, something that's gonna appreciate. I thought that was really smart. We're actually, our generation, <laughs> anyone who's 50 like me, um, is tied to owning a vehicle, they are not. So transportation is a, a huge asset that sets the community apart, especially if you're trying to attract younger people who don't want a three bedroom, two bathroom, two car garage because they won't have two cars. They want to live downtown, right down the street from the brew pub and the wine bar and the yoga studio and the live theater and the boutique hotel. They want walkability <coughs> and they want public transportation. But it's not just public transportation to go up and down Main Street. You have nodes where you have the arts district and you have the recreation facility. Transportation between those units, um, between those, those places, is incredibly valuable and important to connect people. Because you have a lot of assets to sell, but unless you have a car, especially in the winter, it could be a little bit of a, a challenge to get there. Number four, inclusive and informed community. Uh, embracing diversity for its enriching impact will foster relationships and partnerships that lead to innovative solutions and opportunities, strengthening our community as we progress together. This is not just a catchphrase these days. 
This is something fundamentally important to whether or not your community is going to be prosperous and successful. Inclusivity, diversity, and equity are foundational to doing anything these days. We, it's, it's not just cute. And I, so when I do presentations, like let's say I'm in Utah, there's a thousand municipal leaders in the audience. I look at them and I say, are you a welcoming community? Is yours a welcoming community? And about half the room puts their hands up. And I look at the ones that didn't put their hands up and I say, you should be ashamed. And they, they nod and put their head down like, yeah, we are, we're not very welcoming. And then I look at the rest of them and go, and the rest of you are liars. <laughs> because we're not actually very welcoming communities. We're, a, we're friendly, like we don't chase people out of town with baseball bats, screaming at them. If someone stops us and says, where's a good restaurant? We give them advice. If they can't find the rec center, we tell them where to go. But are we really welcoming? When new people come here, I would say most of us are not as welcoming as we think. And it's not that we're, we're mean to them, it's that every community is made up of multiple communities. And on average, the average person belongs to almost 100 communities. 20 of them are really close. I belong to a community of consultants. I don't like any of them, most of them, but I belong to that community. I belong to a community of dads who have teenage boys that play soccer. I belong to a community of dads who have teenage boys that also do art. I, I go to those communities, I meet those people. I'm not meaning to be exclusive, but it becomes exclusive because we don't go get outsiders and bring them in. And our communities now, I mean, Canada had 1.2 million new migrants move here from around the rest of the world last year. Well, on average, it was an exceptional year, but on average we were shooting for about 600,000. I still don't think that's enough. I would like Canada to have 100 million people by 2100, mostly because the US things that go on there these days scare me a little bit, and I want to make sure we have enough people to hold our own. But <laughs> it's important to our economy. Estimates are that when we hit 50 million people in this country, we will have the third largest economy in the world. We need new people because we just don't have enough kids. So we need them. But if they're gonna come here, right now they all go to Toronto and Winnipeg and Vancouver because those are the three immigration hubs. We need people in our communities, but they don't know we exist. And if they do know we exist, they don't know whether or not they're welcome here. We need to go get them and make them feel welcome by breaking down some of those barriers. So your council has said they want to engage, number one, with indigenous partners in reconciliation action. I love that so much. <laughs> reconciliation action with indigenous partners through meaningful steps. This means real economic partnerships on real initiatives going on here. There are, you're, you have three indigenous communities right near proximity that are looking for economic opportunities, looking to change the dynamic, looking for real partnerships. And your council's decided it's gonna be real partnerships, not, hey, we'll sign an agreement that says we're gonna get along. No, I mean investment, engagement, and benefits all the way around. Second one, collaborate with the immigration community to create a more inclusive environment for newcomers to Portage, just like I had explained. It just, I'll give you another example. I don't play hockey. I'm probably the only person in Alberta that can't skate, okay? That's because I grew up on a farm. When my feet reached the pedals of the tractor, I had to feed cows, I never got to play. But my brother did, because I was still feeding cows. <laughs> I lived in Coronation Casters 20 miles away and it's a competing neighborhood. They have a scary team. Like we were the Coronation Royals and they were the Caster Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> it's deliberately intimidating. It was <laughs> Yeah, I know. So I had to go sorry, that's a true story. I had to go pick up my brother in the arena in Caster and I knew some of the other high school guys but I didn't play hockey so we weren't friends. They looked at me like, what the hell are you doing here? I was scared they were gonna grab my shirt and pull it over and give me some, and I didn't know how to fight hockey style. So I was, it was very intimidating. I grew up 20 miles away, I was white, and they still, I still felt like that. Imagine someone coming from another country that doesn't have ice and doesn't know how to skate and doesn't even know if they're welcome in the building. And I still hear people all the time say, they can come out and skate. Well, did you tell them they could come out to skate? Did you go get them to invite them out to skate? Did you bring them into the arena, buy them a hamburger so they could see what's going on? Like, we can't expect them to enter into places 
that they're not familiar with, and then complain that they don't engage in the community. We've got to break down the barriers and be more welcoming. Most of our Alberta communities, and I'm sure you guys are the same way, have a very uh, high population now of Filipinos that have come in. I haven't found a community yet in Canada that has Filipino days to celebrate. They like to play basketball. I don't know what they eat. I don't know what their culture is like. I, they're very nice, hardworking, industrious people. Maybe we can celebrate that they're here and what they do, which would attract more, which would help with our labor issues and fill the housing up. You see how it, it starts with saying, we want you to be here. And the third one, enhance communication capabilities to effectively inform and engage with our citizens. I am so glad they chose this one because we have to communicate internally to people in the community to tell the story about who we're becoming or it's gonna fall on deaf ears or it'll just disappear and we'll just keep rambling and complaining that we don't like the investments, that there's too much crime and what's gonna get better? We, so I'm glad they chose an enhanced communication strategy to keep the public informed and to change some of that story. And the last pillar showcasing our community, community beautification and tourism focused investments enhance civic pride and contribute to more livable community. Our objective is to showcase the quality of life in Portage and Prairie through sharing our story. Now they picked again three initiatives to focus on with this. Collaborate with partners to boost, preserve and market our tourism assets for attracting new events and visitors. And I, yeah, this might not seem like much, but we did research across Canada several years ago to ask people where they live and why. Everyone who lived in their hometown, we took out of the equation. We took all those that were left and asked them, why do you live where you do? 31% of them said they found the community from an accident, from a tourism experience, and almost half of them said it was accidental. They stopped in, saw there was a concert going on, saw there was a parade going on, and then they went back and visited because they had a good time at the market or whatever event that was on. They went for a, a folk fest or whatever it was and then they said, you know, this community is pretty nice. And they kept coming back until eventually they said, why did we always come here to visit when we could instead live here? 31% of people chose where they live from some tourism experience, accidental or deliberate. You have so many assets, the more people you can bring out from, say, Winnipeg, or Brandon to see this community, the more likely they are to know what you have to offer, learn more about your community and say, this is a place not only where I want to live, I want to start a business. I want to invest. I could get a job here. The housing is more affordable. The quality of life is better. But if they don't come, they don't know you exist or they don't know what you have as an advantage over others. So I'm excited by that one. Number two, Direct investments towards downtown development to introduce new amenities and enhance the aesthetics. This is more than just businesses. This is quality of life, social experiences, um, live music downtown, other things that help make that core really accessible and a place where, you, where everyone in the community says, hey, let's go see what's happening downtown. I, I don't know what's going on, but there's always something going on downtown and, and let's go down for coffee, let's go down for a glass of wine, let's go see if that boutique is open, let's go see if the theater's open. That's, that's what you want. But aesthetics matter so much. I've had people look at me and say, aesthetics, you mean beauty? I'm like, yeah, I'm like that's superficial. No, it's not. It is not superficial at all. Uh, imagine someone coming into your community and driving down the highway, driving somewhere through the community, and they, they look at it and they say, it looks run down. The, the, the storefronts all have the tin siding on them that really looks like it's just, they had to redo the barn and no one actually cares. It's just, it'll last forever and I'll be able to sell the building soon because I got to get out of this place. That tin never looks complimentary. And so, so they drive by and they look at that. What are they saying to themselves? I don't think anybody cares about this place. They don't care enough about it to take care of it. So why would someone else invest in your community if you're not willing to invest in it? Aesthetics says everything from flowers to twinkle lights to fresh paint to, 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 to trees to greenery all says to people that you love your community enough to take care of it and then they're willing to invest in it too. Aesthetics is foundational to economic progress and success. And just think, I used to use this example all the time. I didn't realize Zeller and the Bay were, were actually sister stores. And I remember when Zellers existed going in 
Everything was a little bit cheaper than it was at the Bay. But I remember going into Zeller's and half the time when my wife would take me in there, the clothes were torn all over the place, the shelves weren't stacked properly, and, and it had the white tile, plastic sort of <coughs> tile looking, and it just looked a little disheveled. I would go into the Bay and it had nice carpet and these wonderful ladies would come up to me that smelled so nice and say, oh, honey, what can I get you? What can I help you with? And I would pay the more in the Bay for the same product because it was a different experience. I mean, weirdly enough, it was about the cheapness. Zellers would still exist and the Bay would have gone broke, but it was the other way around. Not that the Bay's not going to go broke sometime soon. That's just a department store thing, but, but aesthetics matters. And the third one, sustained investment in beautification projects in collaboration with community partners to highlight and showcase our community. More beautification projects, not just on Main Street, but across the entire community. Aesthetics matters. Those are the five key priority areas that we outline. This is your council's response to it in the areas where they're going to focus. Yes, there will be other things not included on this list. No one can do everything all at once. There's a place to start. And I think they've done a great job of picking the priorities that will help first and foremost change the mindset of people in this community to understand how amazing it is and where you're going and make that a reality. And the rest will follow as they make progress on that. If you have questions, I would like to call up Mayor Knox and where's Nathan? There is. Nathan can come up too. And the three of us will do our best to answer any questions you may have. 